Once again, a very good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'm the Flying Dutchman. My name is Angel, and we're from the Big Show on Kiss 92. And it's great to see all of us, all of you here today. We're going to be discussing Budget 2024. It is the Budget 2024 uh, talk show. The session is organized by REACH, which is the Government Feedback and Engagement Unit. So today is really an opportunity for you to discuss budget issues that matter to you and really get to understand what this year's budget was all about. I mean, the Budget 2024 was on the 14th of February. Perfect, because it was Valentine's Day. Absolutely. And, uh, the, package, the, right the government did announce a lot of uh, help for uh, young seniors as well as families with children. I think it was, it was generally a very good budget. I know some people have some questions and that is why we're here today to discuss that. Different people were affected in different ways by the budget, but generally a very, very good budget. We've got a great panel with us today uh, and we'd like you we'd like to introduce you to them so let's begin okay our first guest is uh, senior parliamentary secretary ministry of health and ministry of law miss rahayu mazam can we welcome her on stage thank please thank you We also have co-founder of the woke salary man mr he rui ming <laughs> and finally, we have Managing Partner, Corporate Development and Partnerships at NCS, Mr. Howie Law. Howie Law, sorry. Okay, please have a seat, okay, let's everyone. Okay, have a seat. Okay, so a very diverse panel with us today. Um, and it's going to be quite a discussion on Budget 2024. There is a lot to discuss. Uh, you've seen it discussed in Parliament, you've seen it discussed on the news, and a lot online as well. On social media, yeah, yeah there's yeah. been plenty of chatter. Uh, so we are going to first get all of our guests to introduce themselves, uh, starting with our senior parliamentary uh, secretary for Ministry of Law and Ministry, uh, Ministry of uh, Ministry of Law and Ministry of Health, Ms. Rahayu Mazam. Thank you so much, Angelique. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Still, yes, I came all the way from Jurong or Bukit Batok. Wow. So, like, feels like a weather change. <laughs> <laughs> But um, anyway, thank you so much for having me here. As you mentioned, I'm the Senior Parliamentary Secretary of Ministry of Health and Ministry of Law. I'm also the MP of uh, Jurong GRC at uh, the Bukit Batok East Division. Um, so yes, I'm also an, at, um, the advisory panel member of um, REACH, the, the one that was responsible in bringing this event here today. So I'm so happy to have two very prominent DJs, Angelique and the Flying Dutchman, joining us. Very excited and look forward to the discussion. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, Roy Ming, perhaps you could introduce yourself a bit. Uh, hi, my name is Roy Ming. I also came from Jurong uh, today for the, the, the MRT ride quite long. Yeah. Uh, I'm an internet person, so I run a blog called The World Salary Man. We, we started off talking about like personal finance investments, but then we eventually delved into more serious topics like you know, social issues, uh, like stuff like income inequality, globalization, technology, that, that kind of stuff. So very excited to be here and looking forward to learn from everyone on the panel and maybe also people not from the panel. Thank you. Okay, Howie, you're next. Non-Jurong. <laughs> <laughs> Non-Jurong. So there's a bit of diversity. Um, it was good to be here. Uh, look forward to the conversation. NCS, my day job NCS, uh, we are a homegrown tech services company. Uh, in the region, we're about 12,000 people. Singapore, we hire about 6,500. Uh, you know, I've been in tech all my life from IBM to Lenovo and prior to this I was working for IMBA. Um, other than that, one wife, three kids, one dog and 33 fishes. 33 <laughs> fishes! <laughs> oh, little ones. Okay, not like koi. <laughs> okay. so, all right, thank you. Let's begin this morning with, with this. If each of you, in turn, could summarize your thoughts on Budget 2024 in one sentence and perhaps name one budget measure that's piqued your interest. Okay? So what do you think of it in one sentence and one measure that's really piqued your interest? Uh, let's start with Rahayu. The budget 2024 is something that is um, that addresses immediate concerns, but at the same time forward-looking, and I hope also encourages all in the 
um, all stakeholders in the nation to play a part in making our vision into a reality. And my favourite part of the budget personally is the Skills Future Level Up program because yeah. I think many find that interesting, especially I suppose in our age group. Yeah, that's something I look forward to. Okay. Okay, Ruming? Yeah, I found like this year budget, uh, there's like a little change in tone. I think this year is a lot more about like shared responsibility uh, to fellow people, I mean to, to fellow Singaporeans, which I felt really was quite, quite changing because I think in the past maybe there was a lot more focus on individual responsibility. So I feel this year that has changed and, and that is great. Uh, my favourite uh, aspect of the budget was probably the IT Study Award. The one that they will give uh, $5,000 to uh, IT students when they enroll in Polytechnic and then after you complete it then you get $10,000. I think that is like a really powerful way to show that Singapore is trying to show that there are many path to success. It's not just like, you know, you go IT and then GG for you, right? GG is a good game, it's like, you know, it's, it's over for you. But, uh, so it's great that we're actually walking the talk. And I think for, for the longest time, that is probably needed when it comes to policy making. Howie? I think it's, the way I'll phrase it, it's a nice rojak. Because there is something for the arts, there's something for cost of living, there's something for different sectors. So I think it's a nice rojak. And uh, the part, because I'm in tech, the part that got all of us in the industry excited was the AI-related one, as well as the, it's, it sounds small, but the future investments into broadband mm -hmm. as well. So the, the tech elements are exciting. All right. Okay. Uh, so we're here at Fernvale CC, and this is a neighborhood that's very young. Lots of young families here. Lots of parents who both have jobs to provide the best lives for their children. Uh, so today we'll be focusing more on the budget measures announced regarding support for families, workers and businesses. Now we'll have three themes for today. Uh, we'll touch on each of the themes. The first theme is to provide more assurance for families and seniors. Uh, that's building a Singapore made for families. Uh, the second theme is pursuing better growth and jobs and equipping our workers for life. And the final theme will be building a resilient future and forging a stronger and more united nation. So once again, we have our QR codes up. If you have not put your questions in yet, please scan the QR code, get your questions in, and we'll try to address each of them. Yep, so make sure you scan that code, get your questions in. Let's start this whole discussion uh, with you, Ruming, for example. I mean, you've got a very strong following on social media with the Woke Salaryman. Uh, many of your followers are the age where they would be parents, they would have young children. Could you perhaps share what your followers and people around you thought about the support given in Budget 2024 for families and households? Yeah, I mean, taking into account the rising cost of living. Sure, I think gonna be like real real for a second. I think honestly most people will just focus on the goodies. Right. The there's like the CDC vouchers, the GST vouchers, the USA vouchers. So I think that's what most people will tend to focus on. But I think in general, uh, what the the measures done and I don't have to list all of them out because it's really quite long. But I feel like what all the measures done is like they have uh, reduced like the basic cost of living for most people. So there will definitely be a group that uh, benefits from that. For example, the people who are going to have children, no matter what, irregardless of budget. I think for those people, stuff like the reduced uh, uh, childcare center fees, like that's going to make a difference. But I think what it probably won't address is uh, the more aspirational aspects of raising a family in Singapore. You know, stuff like people like they want to buy a car, they want to, to be very competitive and send their kids to uh, a more, you know, perceive at our school. So th those things will definitely not be covered by budget because they are a lot more aspirational, they are a lot more expensive and I think it's important to acknowledge that. And I think for, uh, for people who are on the fence on you know, maybe raising children, I, I, I don't think the budget covers anything for that because I think uh, for a large group of people, when they want to raise kids, their mentality is like, I want to raise kids and give them a good future if I cannot provide them like a good future, I will just have, I will just not have kids. And I think uh, recently it was reported that our fertility rate dropped to 0 0.97. So, so yeah, I think that's going to be the trend for a while. 
Okay. I, I mean, to, to be fair, you know, it's not that you should expect budget to, to stop it. I'm not saying like it's useless or whatever. I mean, it's great, it's wonderful, but I, I do think uh, if, you, if you want more young, young families, you need more than a budget to just shift that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, the, the, the handouts are not to help you get through life. It's just to alleviate some of the costs of living. So on that note, uh, Rahayu, the government has been giving quite a few handouts uh, during budget over the past few years and this year as well. Like the CDC vouchers, cash as well uh, with the enhanced assurance package. So how is the government paying for this? Uh, first question, and is it really sustainable, especially since we have an aging population which is going to require more money in terms of healthcare costs? Um, thank you for the question. Actually, the question is a good one because it comes from a space of knowing that these funds don't appear from thin air. It is actually something that has to be put together, has to be managed, and has to be sustainable for the long run for Singaporeans. And I think that's an important dimension of the budget because people have to understand that you need to put something in the pot. There needs to be work and effort and the economy being built because otherwise we cannot sustain this life for Singaporeans. So on that note, I want to mention that um, you know this term has been used quite often with uh, cautiously optimistic. We had a fairly good growth in 2020. 2023, we avoided a recession, a very modest growth of 1.1%. And we expect 2024 to a little bit, be a bit more challenging. But we do expect um, better growth. Um, and inflation to stabilize a little bit. But there are a lot of uncertainties because we know that as a nation, we are affected by things that's happening. You know, geopolitical tensions impact us and hence there is that concern. So we are cautious in that we are continuing to build our economy, um, but we know that we need to also manage the immediate concerns of Singaporeans, hence the handouts, hence the support that we are giving in one dimension. But um, to your larger question, how is this sustainable? That's why as the budget is not the only thing that we do, right? There are many different work screens. But it does give the context of all the different things that we're looking at, including larger term issues. Um, and I just want to kind of tie it back to what Ruben says about how some things in the budget cannot immediately resolve it, but we are putting in building blocks to resolve it. Point in um, uh, an example, for example, uh, it also relates to what you said. Like when we uh, look at how we are putting in monies to the ITE Progression Award, it is also a move to actually um, um, change our definitions of success. Because we know that parents want to be competitive. We know that at the start of it all, we want, um, you know, parents will want to make sure that their child will all be, you know, going to universities. We want to show that there are alternative pathways to success and that it's okay. So there are a lot of things that we need to do at the back end. Because if we look at countries, say, like South Korea, recently in the news, for the fact that no matter what you throw at the couples, nobody wants to have children anymore because life has just gotten to a point where people are feeling hopeless. We don't want people to feel hopeless. Hence, there are deep, deep, deeper measures of things like, for example, um, looking at where can we support um, and ensure that we close the gap in the inequality, making sure that people who maybe start off with less don't do so well in the earlier stages, later on can still have a second bite at the cherry. We look at building capabilities of Singaporeans. So we have the Skills Future Progression, you know, IT Progression or Skills Future Level Up program. So we look at the long terms. We look at uniting Singaporeans, putting in monies at tech, at um, sports, at, you know, arts, because these are all different dimensions of life. And we have other laws and regulations that we're looking at, the anti-discriminatory law and all that, to try and create a better ecosystem. So long and short of it is that we're looking long term. And sustaining it is really challenging, so we need to be preventive. We're looking at preventive health. We're looking at how we can build capabilities so that no matter what happens in the economy, our people are going to be good enough, steady enough to go out there in the markets and still be resilient. So there is that portion of like, the money side of the house, but there's also that portion of the aspirational portion which may not be so immediate to people, but we are putting in the seeds of this so that there are changes in the way we perceive things, there are changes in the way we um, uh, see what success is for future generation, and hopefully this is something that can translate to better lives for Singaporeans in the long run. Okay, so we're now going to move on to the second theme uh, of today, which is pursuing better growth and jobs and equipping our workers for life. So other than supporting families and households, the budget also has a strong focus on supporting businesses 
and upskilling workers. So it's great that we have Howie here. Now, Howie, it's your turn to take the mic. Uh, he is the managing partner at NCS, and he's going to give us a better perspective of employers and bigger businesses. And Reeming also will give us the perspective of the woke salarymen and also SME owners. So this question is for both of you, starting with Howie. Um, there are quite a few measures to support businesses uh, in this year's budget, especially to strengthen companies' competitive advantage as well as going green. Now, as, employ as an employer, do you find these measures helpful in encouraging businesses to improve their service offerings and also to be more sustainable? So, I'll, I'll start with an admission. I, I kind of cheated in preparation for this. So, I, I spoke to all of my friends in my, in my chat groups to say, dudes, you know, I'm going in, um, what's your thoughts? And I think the conclusion is that there are direct benefits and there's indirect benefits perhaps in the nearer future. The direct benefits are quite straightforward, whether it is the corporate income tax uh, rebates, whether it is the enhanced productivity funds and all that, because those are additional supplements or vitamins that is available. So generally they are welcome. The indirect benefits comes from, or, or on the green area, I think there's some funding for green reporting as well. So those are very short-term supplements you can take. But what we also encourage is the forward planning. So for example, the 5B Future Energy Fund, to try and move all of us into a carbon light uh, energy uh, footprint. That will come in the future, but that will benefit only in the future. The AI investments will benefit the near future. The skills future top up, the 4K top up, we think it's going to be exciting for us because in the tech industry, we are very, very, very short of tech talents. So anytime we have someone that says, I'm prepared to get retrained in technology, we're always excited. So on a broad level, we're excited about the general feedback is the short term is great, different things for different people. but. The bigger excitement is in the future proving. So I, I can't speak for Going Green because my company only has five people. So maybe the impact of being uh, environmentally sustainable maybe not that high. But maybe I can speak about uh, the other measures. I think in general, uh, my friends in the startup space, they, they find like, the things quite helpful. But the things that they were, they are already companies that were already uh, making all these changes by themselves. So by themselves, they will send their employees for training, all that stuff. So what I'm curious to see, like for a lot of traditional SMEs, right, like, will this move the needle for them? Because even if you have like good initiatives out there, sometimes the carrot approach might not work. And I do think for a lot of SME companies, for the longest time they have been very reliant on foreign labor, and then there's like a very big barrier towards them like investing in technology because the the, the talke will be like, well, you want me to invest uh, 100, 100, like one million on this, then. Maybe the results not even there, I, 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 and I can still use you know cheap labor or cheap foreign labor to, to get it there. So I think the inertia to change is is quite big for a lot of SMEs, and I think sometimes also uh, what might force people to change isn't just budget, but also could be like the world around them. I remember seeing this uh, joke on, on LinkedIn. It's like what force your company to do uh, digital transformation. So the three options were one the CEO, two the CTO, three COVID nineteen. So sometimes like whether or not a, a, a country changes really depends on whether or not they, they want to change, not whether it's like throwing more and more uh, goodies at people. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that's Okay, so we, we've heard that the tech industry is short of people. Uh, and that, that to me is, is, is an interesting thing with this $4,000 skills future uh, uh, credit, right? So there's also the ITE graduates who go through the progression award why is this all being implemented now so I think um, Rimin kind of um, highlighted earlier that there is a tone in the budget right um, of, of shift this budget is actually a follow-through from our uh, future um, our conversations um, that we've had with uh, Singaporeans to actually understand what are some of their concerns some of their preoccupation and really to bring them together um, in this journey, the Forward Singapore journey. And um, one of the key things, you know, that we, we do identify with is the fact that, you know, with Singapore, we don't have natural resources. Our most precious of resources is manpower. And so we really need to make sure that we give the best to this group. 
we want to make sure that they are well equipped to um, be able to be going out there, be resilient, and also be able to adjust to changes. Because the reality is that things are going to evolve out there and we need to continually have them progressing up. So we, that's one key imperative as to why we make sure that this is something that is put in place. Because you don't want to just give the fish, you really want to teach people how to fish. The second dimension of it is in relation in particular to the ITE Progression Award, is that we start to see disparity with people who start off with less and then having a little bit more difficulties um, achieving that success in life. We don't want that to happen. We think that ITE graduates should be able to have as much success and capability to um, proceed upwards in life, very much like their other diploma and uh, graduate counterparts. So we want to make sure that this is a boost that's available to them to be able to reach that. So these are some of the key considerations in terms of how we want to actually uh, shift um, the thinking of the people. And like women said, because to some extent you can just put it out there, but a large part also requires Singaporeans to be willing to change their mindsets and take it up. Of course, we will facilitate it. So um, an example was with the small firms you know, and the small companies. What we do is we try and put nudges in place, incentives in place, but also support. Like, um, for example, I'm from the legal sector. We have a lot of um, programs that we've worked out with uh, GovSG as well as uh, GovTech as well as IMDA to make sure that there are tools to help people progress from one step to another. So I think it's going to be work in progress to change people's mindsets, to walk this journey with them. But I think we have to start somewhere. And so this, I think, is a good start. It is encouraging. It's motivating. Hopefully, it has a lot of take up and people also walk this journey with us. Thank you very much, Rahayu. OK, we're going back to the gentleman. And um, uh, Raymond, you said SME, you have five employees. And then, of course, uh, Howie, you come from a much bigger company, you know, thousands of employees. Now, either way, upskilling will take away time from your employees, take their time away from focusing on work. So is that why, as employers or even some employees, may not be keen to, to, to upskill? And also, the government is introducing a temporary financial support scheme uh, for workers who become involuntarily unemployed while they undergo training and look for better fitting jobs. What, do, what are your thoughts on this as an SME owner and someone who comes from a bigger corporation? Um, let, me, let me start with uh, the tech industry. The tech industry perhaps is a little bit unique in that we're generally quite paranoid because we know that technology moves really fast. So in the tech industry, we used to talk about a vertical skill. Then some years ago, we started talking about the T-skills because you need horizontal skills to work with people, problem solving, communication, but you still need a specific skill. Nowadays, we talk about the MBS skills because you need multiple deep skills because skills will come and skills will go quite quickly in tech so in many organizations like NCS we put we do overweight on training uh, and it's part of a budget it's part of the expectation that people will take time away to get trained um, so I would say that maybe in the tech industry and, and for companies like NCS training is seen as a necessary part because we do need the employees to be productive so it's a necessary evil. So the, the, the different initiatives are helpful. Uh, the, the larger industry, the big companies, I think perhaps I would say that it's a bit of a mixed bag because it's always a conundrum to say if I train you well, but after the training you decide to go somewhere else, how do I retain the benefit? So it's always a little bit of that, that catch-22. Um, but I think increasingly companies who dwell in tech recognize that it is a necessary evil. Ruim, Ruimin? Yeah, so I think for us, I mean, we're only a very small company of five people, but I think how, how we see training is, is a way to both like reward staff and show them that we are invested in their future. But of course, I do understand, you know, training is, is downtime, so that's why uh, employers might not do it. And sometimes even for employees, right, for them, the perspective is like, I still got my job, huh? so why I go and uh, upskill? But from my point of view, often things can like go on for quite a while, even though the, the underlying market forces has kind of deteriorated. It's kind of like when you, you off a torchlight, right? The torchlight glow for three seconds more. So sometimes, like even though your industry is disrupted, 
like your job might be there for two to three more years but in the long run the whole thing will go away and I think that's what Singaporeans uh, need to realize and also uh, it's better to upskill in like small small steps right versus like one big step that might eventually kill you wait uh, this was the second part question so I split up like social studies so I, I got part B <laughs> let me look at part B again okay so you asked about the the and the supports financial scheme for people who are who will be involuntary unemployed Our jobs. yeah I I think it's great I think uh, for the longest time uh, when people get unemployed you know they don't have any financial security so I think this is a good move and also because uh, in the world because of what Howie mentioned uh, technological disruption will ensure like job loss will become a more and more frequent thing so I think overall good what I'm probably more concerned is uh, abuse of such things and I, I and I do think just because there's like a small group of abusers doesn't mean we need to do with the whole thing I think the amount should be not anything like you know your your last six months salary right because I think if you were to prepare for emergency unemployment uh, financial support shouldn't do that it should be a combination of both that and also your uh, personal savings so I would say uh, I'll be more cautious in how much amount is given but I think like give them like a a fair amount a fair amount to get your basic needs sorted because if not you know people might wanna spend a lot more uh, I think most Singaporeans don't even have like three to six months of emergency yeah. savings and we don't wanna enforce that because you don't want too many uh, people who abuse the system because in the long term the system won't be sustainable but of course we will be it's good that we are giving uh, some a, a little form of safety net for, for our people Howie, I'd like to address something that our DPM brought up during the speech, AI. Because I think that's, that's really up your The National AI Strategy 2.0. Uh, can you tell us how jobs and businesses are going to be impacted by this new AI strategy? Um, I'll caveat that I'm extremely biased. And... Judging from your grey hair, I suspect that you and I are of similar vintage. Abs absolutely. So, perhaps a question back. Can you remember when the PCs first came to the world? Yes. That created a wave of disruption. New companies, new jobs. Yes. Can you remember when WWW came along? Yes. That created a new wave, new jobs, some jobs died. And then 2007. Steve Jobs announced the iPhone. That's right. Today, everything is app-based. We never thought that would happen. Yeah. There's a lot of people who strongly believe that AI is all of them combined and more mm. in terms of potential disruption. Disruption meaning opportunities as well as potential challenges. Yeah. So I'm excited that, that the good news is that Singapore is... The bad news is that Singapore is not known for AI. The, bad, the good news is that no country is really known for AI. So there's an opportunity for Singapore to really push ahead. And we're quite unique in that many countries leave it to the corporates to run it. But here, we're getting a little bit of boost from the national AI strategy to try and do it collectively. So I'm biased because I think it's going to create new opportunities for everyone. And doing it together uh, in Singapore is perhaps the best place to do it. I, yeah. I just want to ask one question if any of the three of you have an answer for. What do you say to the person who is afraid that AI is going to replace him? What do you say to that person? Because there are a lot of people out there who are very, very worried that they are going to be replaced by a machine or by, by a software. What can we say to them? So the conversations that we've been having in this space is multifold, I suppose. There are many different dimensions of looking at it. You can choose to see a glass half full or a glass half empty, right? And you can choose to be afraid and then run off and then be upset about it. Or we can do something about it and, you know, like how we say, just latch on these opportunities because it's still green space right now. Um, what I would say is this, and, and hence the moves that we are making, it's really that you're not walking this journey alone. We are very cognizant of it. And, um, you know, the, the truth is, I mean, I, I don't want to sound biased. I am working with the government. But, you know, if you talk about 
many other countries who are largely preoccupied with their politics, they have had not the time to kind of really talk about this. I, I go to India, I go to China. Okay, China is, of course, a different machinery, right? In India, in the legal fraternity especially, they are saying of a lot of the things that we're moving with our legislation, oh, that's so good, there's a lot of um, government initiative and helping. Um, my uh, retort to that is that the good thing is that, you know, we're moving some way, but people are not building that resilience because they are very dependent on the government to move things. Anyway, that point aside, the, the fact is that the government is cognizant of this incoming wave and change and we will put in things in place to help support Singaporeans. So you're not alone in this. But it requires also one step from us, one step from you. You do need to be willing to change that. And so how we are trying to do it is to create this culture of, you know, upskilling. You know, we've spoken about skills future for many years. And so we're just building on these conversations because we want people to know that change is uncomfortable, it's inevitable, but it is not impossible. And you're not alone in this journey. We're giving you the support, but you need to take that step forward. We can walk this journey with you. That's well said. Yeah. And Very I, think, well I think baby steps is key. And as Howie said, we're all learning as we go along. Uh, okay, we're, we've reached our final theme once again if you have any questions we're going to be uh, addressing them in a short moment you like, scan your the QR code put your questions in and we will get to them uh, if we can now um, we've already talked about how the government is supporting workers and businesses but the budget also talked about safeguarding our future and forging a more united future for young families. So, Rahayu, this one is going to be for you. Now, it's interesting to see that although there is a lot of emphasis on supporting households, families, workers and businesses, there's still a portion of the budget that looks at building a resilient future. Now, this may not seem too important to a lot of people. Uh, so, you, could you share why these measures are important to Singapore as a whole? Yeah, you know, um, a lot of things that um, we see in, like for example, this CC, you know, um, it's a whole place of an opportunity for people to come together to um, use the services to actually, you know, have activities. We see the roads, we see transportation, and it, it sometimes I feel that because these things just happen, we don't realize that it actually takes planning and building and monies and resources. And there are a lot of invisible things that goes behind the scenes in nation building. So part of it is physical infrastructure, but another part is building the nation, the right um, psyche, the right bond, you know, and the right um, mindsets. And that requires also investments and early building. And so that's why we think it's important for us to continually put in monies in these investments, which people may not realize is happening behind the scenes. One aspect is our NS men. That has always been something we're very proud of. So we've dedicated monies to that, you know, in that space. We look at energies because we know that we're talking about our, um, our commitments at COP and, you know, being, doing our part in the green space. So we need to look at how we shift our energy. So we've put in monies for our future energy fund, you know, to make sure that we're prepared for it. We look at things also from the perspective of what are some of the other spaces which we want to grow as a nation. The art space, we've put in monies there because we want to show people the alternative pathways that this, you know, builds our culture, our community. We look at sports, facilities, you know, how can people keep healthy and active and have that evolve, you know, uh, around us in our communities. So these are sort of invisible parts of the budget and of the nation building that people don't see that we invest in, but they are important because our lives weave into these spaces, into these, um, you know, communities. And so we need to take effort and time to put in investments in these spaces. So I, I do hope that um, with conversations like this, um, and you know, it, it's been said that this budget is a series of budgets following from the Forward SG conversation. We hope people walk this journey with us as we unpack and evolve different dimensions of how we build this nation together. Because it's no longer about the government being the one in charge and okay, you are the government, I pay you money, you must make sure all these things run. No, because we're going to run out of solutions. And the demographic is such that it's changing, it's getting to be a bit more challenging. We need you in this journey with us. Okay. That's um, yeah. Unfolding. It, unfolding. It's, it's, Little it bits. Is going to, we need, I think, uh, uh, especially the young need a bit of patience as this unfolds. It's a very instant generation. We need it, some instant patience. gratification. Yes. Yeah. 
Okay, so we're going to be moving on to our question and answer session. Uh, once again, if you have any, I, I don't know if there's time for you to still get your questions in, uh, because we have picked the top three questions uh, for this morning. Yes, uh, we have. Uh, actually, the top voted questions have all been about uh, young children and aging parents. Uh, are there, for those of you who submitted questions on young children and aging parents, would you like to raise your hand and ask those questions live rather than us ask it? Anybody uh, submitted a question on young children and aging parents? Did anyone submit? You stand a chance to win uh, vouchers if you put your hand up and tell us what your question is. If not, we can also ask it. Okay, I tell you what, why don't we ask the question? Um, okay, first question I was, what was the key focus of the budget and how does it help families with young children and aging parents? Uh, perhaps Senior Parliamentary Secretary could answer that. So, um, the budget really just gives you kind of a broad blush on things, right? And I don't know if you're following the parliamentary discussions. Each ministry is also going to be unpacking all the different initiatives that they're going to be having. And we've started already in the last week. We're going to continue in the coming weeks. There are many like, small pockets of items, um, but a large part of it has also already been announced previously. Um, as Rumin also mentioned, right? what we look at in terms of what this sandwich generation face because they have to take care of the elderly they have to take care of the young kids um, there are many big ticket items that they uh, have to address and deal with so we look at those big ticket items and see how we can provide that support so with child care um, you know preschool uh, working mother subsidies and all that that has been announced in a different tranche we are now looking at the elderly support and how they can be managed and supported within the community. So there will be you know, um, support that, will be, that has already also been given, but enhancements as to how we look at ageing and how we can support those who are caregivers in this journey. So you are looking at like big ticket items from the top and the bottom. I think to identify specific items that matter to you, you can always go and look at the budget website and figure out what are some of the support available. Mm. Um, but largely the point is this, we look at big ticket items, we look at um, support within the community, parking it within something that is accessible, and we're always constantly re looking and reviewing um, the means test, which we know a lot of people feel, you know, while their incomes are growing, some of their uh, you know, expenses are also increasing. We're also looking at how we regulate that over time. So hopefully with some of this view and with people coming in to provide more support, um, people will feel um, that their challenges are alleviated a little yeah. bit. Uh, the other question I've got to admit uh, was, uh, was the whole CPF thing was kind of important to me because of where I am in my age group. Uh, one of the questions is, if I top up my CPF retirement fund to the maximum, will I still qualify for the silver support scheme and the silver bonus? So silver support is a very niche scheme which people <coughs> may not fully grasp. Okay, starting point is this. Huh? The government has many many different types of support for very different things. Silver support was a very niche one um, to actually help those who, when they were younger, um, didn't earn as much. So there are very specific criteria with silver support, including at a certain age, a certain amount of monies in your CPF and what your current living situation is, your finances and all that. So there are certain specific criteria. And when we sized the silver support at that juncture, we were looking at out of 10 seniors, two will get silver support. Not because we don't want to help people, but that was sized to be specifically for those who were low income when they were younger. And so we wanted to kind of top up so that they could sustain. So that's why a lot of people compare with their friends, say, how come they get, I don't get kind of thing, right? But it is sized for that. If you don't get, it means that you are actually not meant for that group. But that doesn't mean if you need help, you don't get help because there are other support assistance through the social service officers, through the CHAS, through our um, subsidies in the medical um, front, you know, at, at medical expenses. So it's really about, it's a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, we'll need to look and see what your circumstances are and maybe fit you with some of the support available. And me just to touch on a kind of tangential point, this is where I feel, you know, the women point about um, 
make reference a lot to you because as you're answering questions, you're also giving a lot of feedback, right, about some of the sentiments that people feel about our budget. The point is that, you know, what about overconsumption or abuse and all that? Um, I think we really need to have the right mindset. We put out these monies and support because we want to help the right people. It's targeted. So it's not like government give, I must take. I think we do want to have a culture where if we do need the help, the help comes easily to you. But it is not just about looking at the other side and how come you never give me, how come you don't give yeah. me. And that, I hope, is also part of nation building. You're all in this together. This is all your family, you know, to see you know. So together, hopefully, if someone needs it, we give them. And if you can manage, you can give, that is a very fortunate place to be in. And we shouldn't feel so disadvantaged because we're not getting some of those help. I agree. Sorry, and I, I, I think... I, oh, go ahead. Something. I think recently in the personal finance space, people were very unhappy because the uh, CPS special account will close after 55 years old because people were un unhappy that uh, if you have above the full retirement sum, you won't be able to put your monies into the special account and earn 4%. So I understand the disappointment. It's always nasty to lose like a good deal from the government. But you must remember, right, if you reach full retirement sum, right, you're already doing not bad already. Eh? So I think, that, I think that's the thing what SPS was talking about. I think there's, there's a tendency for Singaporeans to be very like, is it, can I say like niam or like very like, everything also want to win. So I've heard people say like they want to BTO because it's a Singaporean right, even though they might not need pu uh, public housing. Then what they do is they, they go live with their parents uh, through the five years, then at the end, they go sell the BTO for a profit. I mean, what kind of nonsense is that, right? I think like as a country, if you really want this country to be sustainable, we need to, we need to stop this kind of behavior. If not, then this is like someone, like, you know, someone put like a free ref refrigerator of food, like, you know, in, in the void deck. Yeah. Then somebody just go raid the refrigerator and spoil it for everyone else. And I do think like there is that culture in Singapore that exists and we probably need to address it in the long term if these welfare measures are to be sustainable as well. I think you're absolutely right. Absolutely there are a few right. bad apples, yeah. but mostly I think we're good the, apples. <laughs> the other thing I will tell you, and this is something I have found sitting in coffee shops in my Chua Chukang area, people have problems with CPF and they all sit in a coffee shop and suddenly they're talking and they are all CPF experts. You're not. You're not. And I only, I'm only saying this because I did this a few months ago. Sit down, go to the CPF, sit down and talk with an officer. He has the time to explain everything to you. You will know what to do. You just need to talk to them and not talk to your friends who don't know anything about it. Coffee shop talk. Coffee shop talk. <laughs> don't talk to CPF especially with all these new changes, because that is what you need to do. That's what's going to help you, nothing else. Okay. All right, we're down to our final question. Um, and remember, if you submitted any of these questions, you are up for a voucher. So please remember to go to the registration voucher, uh, registration table to get your vouchers. So we're going moving on to technology right now. Now, uh, this is a question. As a small technology company, our focus is on hustling and getting business. How are we expected to benefit from the AI strategy and the skills future? We're highly dependent on external labor for many jobs that citizens do not want to do. With the budget geared towards job upgrade, what about the low-skilled jobs? Howie? The, I, I think... Um just based on this conversation, I changed my original analogy of a good uh, roja to a nice plate of vitamins and supplements because you may not need to take every supplement. It depends on, like SPS, depends on what you need. And the, the good news is that this is just the latest plate of supplements. There are existing programs in place, whether it is by IMDA, whether it is by Enterprise Singapore. A lot of it is targeted at SMEs for different SMEs in different sectors. So okay, we have time for one question from the floor. If there's anyone who has a burning question from the floor, uh, just put your hand up and uh, our panelists we'll uh, will be able microphone. to address it. Anyone? Yeah, we have a gentleman in the back. If you can come on over. Oh, don't worry, they'll give him a microphone. There's, oh, a, there's, microphone a, mi right oh, there's a microphone following you behind. We can can we go. just get your name and your question? My name is Tan, 
Your name yeah, is Mr. Okay. Tan, okay? Yes. We are talking about upskilling, using your skill future. I'm a gen in the PG group. No matter how up, upskill courses you take, you will never get employed. So, should the government address this benefit for these PG people? Okay. So he's, um, Mr. Tan is, I think, 70 if I hear correctly, and he says no matter how many courses you go for Skills Future, you still can't get employed. And so he wants the government to address this. Actually, this is a feedback that we've been also receiving. I have a lot of residents. I'm in Bukit Batok East and um, it's an older estate. So yeah. a lot of the, um, those who come to see me are also of a certain age group. And we understand and we hear this. So there are a couple of tweaks and things that we're looking at. Firstly, in terms of skills future, there is also a lot of assessment now to make sure that the courses that we take will then translate to something that you can be able to work on. You don't want to just pay for courses and in the end cannot do anything about it. So there's a lot more focus on ensuring that it will translate to a certain job. Um, the second thing is that for elderly, it is a little bit challenging because it is also employers and their mindsets. Because, um, and this was something we were shifting with campaigns. In particular, there is also some legislation that is going to be rolled out in place to make sure that um, no discrimination that is um, unwarranted happens, you know, because if let's say you really are qualified, you can do the job, you can really put in the effort, then there's no reason why your employer cannot employ you. And so hence, uh, that will be illegal for them to discriminate, you see. But it does get tricky, right, with legislation because on the ground, it is really about people willing to change. So we are also working with SNAF, with the union, to engage employers to shift their mindsets and supporting them in this journey by doing things like paying for training, giving them incentives to employ older workers, also helping them with redesigning of jobs. Because when you redesign jobs, you can try and meet in the middle with regards to the capabilities. So there are efforts in place and I hope um, you know, there will be an opportunity for Mr. Tan to you know, embark on his second career. Because the reality is as Singaporeans, you know, we have these statistics often repeated. One in four by 2030 will be above 65 and how? You have to have manpower, right? So we need to change that mindset that people at a certain age can still work. You need to continue to keep active, still be healthy. You, know, you need to keep skilled so that you can then continue to contribute to the community for as long as you want. Sorry, I cannot add. So I think there's also a lot of like uh, disgruntlement towards SME owners, which I feel are valid because a lot of them uh, have like very outdated practice. Uh, among them is ageism. So if there are young people here, I also encourage them to start their own businesses. So you can literally be the change you want to see in the world. Because if you sometimes wait for a very like uh, stubborn SME owner to change, right? It could take like forever to change. They might not even change in their lifestyle because I think changing mindsets is probably one of the hardest things that uh, like it takes. La. For example, like the, the Kiamsiak mindset has been around for 50 years. I also don't know how long more it will last. So if you do want to see change, the best part of, the best thing you can do is to be part of the change. I think that is like the fastest and most uh, if, yeah, impactful way. La, because. The government got limited things, but the government cannot go and force people to hire, you know, like people above a certain age. Like that's not going to happen. It's like the free market that the, the free market has to change its behavior, change its thinking. Then only can change be sustainable and efficient. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, we've really run out of time. Thank you very much, Howie. Any last thoughts? Let's start with you. I think end of the day is, is, uh, is the mindset. I think on the individual level, uh, on a company level, um, I think that will all contribute to the national level, but I think what we can control is the individual level and within the companies we work with. So I think it's all in the mindset. The government's first step has, baby step has moved forward. I think obviously it's up to the rest of us to take on that step as well. Raming? Any, any final thoughts on uh, what was said today? I think everyone just do their part. I think I, I say a lot already, so thank you very much. <laughs> um, I would say that, you know, it is all work in progress. Nation building is work in progress, and I hope we walk this journey together. Um, but I do want to just use my time to sell Koyok. 
I think all of you would have the bags in your seats, right? That is Rich. Rich is the one that organizes today and I think it is a very meaningful way for us to continue to get inputs and feedback so that we can actually change and make lives better for Singaporeans. Actually, your feedback really matters. They do take it seriously and you know, you may not see a change immediately, but it happens over time. I mean, I've seen it. I've been a volunteer since I was 70. I'm 40, 17 and I'm 44 this year and I do see evolution of change and so I hope that all of you participate in that. We have a lot of our handles in that. Uh, uh, we have IG, LinkedIn, Facebook and all that. Whichever modality, we also have a listening point. Please feel free to give your feedback and hopefully this translates into better lives for our fellow countrymen. Speaking of feedback, uh, where can Singaporeans give their feedback about Budget 2024? So there is a, a website that you can do so, but today we have a physical listening point where you can just immediately walk up to my colleagues there and give your feedback. I think that's the best part. Yeah. If you do have anything to say about the budget, the reach listening point is where you should be. Yeah, and you've got an actual person to speak to, so no technology involved in this. No scanning of QR codes, just head to the reach listening point. Well, I, well, we hope that today has been very, very helpful for every one of you. We do apologize for not being able to answer all your questions, but we'd like to also thank uh, our panelists for today for spending your Saturday morning with us. Thank you.